Hello and welcome to College Physics One. I, this is going to be an exciting two semester adventure and I'd like to go ahead and share that with you. So what I wanted to do today is to give an introduction and walk through chapter one of our textbook. And I think you'll find it's pretty well written. There's a lot of good accessible information that I'm hoping that you guys will find valuable. And so the, the textbook is College Physics, the 11th edition. Um, Raymond Surway is a primary author. And this is an attempt to try and create a, an accessible course, um, say for folks majoring in biology, the health professions or other disciplines that may not have calculus. And so that is something that they try and show the the material in a, in a way that you can understand it but without using calculus but leveraging algebra geometry and um, trigonometry and so it is an introductory textbook and it wants to provide a clear and logical presentation of the basic material um, there's a lot of emphasis on the physical arguments problem solving methodology and um, a lot of hands-on information both in the textbook as well as the um, lecture material that we'll be using. And so uh, with that, it is a two semester course, um, set of courses, and we're going to be covering what's in this first column. And so we'll be talking about mechanics, thermodynamics, vibrations and waves, and just begin to do an introduction to electricity and magnetism just with one chapter. And then in the following semester, we'll We'll focus on these three areas, electricity and magnetism, cover the rest, talk about light and optics and, and modern physics. And so um, I think you'll like the way that things are set up in each of these chapters. And so the first chapter or topic is we'll be talking about units, trigonometry and vectors. And if you look at the sign, it's we notice how it's given in both um, kilometers per hour and, and miles per hour. And so a question that you can be asking is how accurate is that conversion? And so say if you've ever driven up to, to Canada, um, you might have seen a, a sign like this that is trying to, to show both, both of those. And that is a good question to be thinking about, well, how accurate is it? Um, and then we, we're gonna be a, have a variety of things that we'll talk about in terms of um, how many significant digits are you talking about in terms of how you would uh, respond to an answer, et cetera. So um, before we get into that, we're gonna be going over these reading questions and this is typically how we'll be starting each lecture, um, a little bit of a review of the reading. And so uh, you'll get a chance to, to see how this relates to um, different parts of what you have covered um, as you've been re reviewing the material. So this first question is, which of the following would serve as the best time standard? And you can see there's four different things and it can range all the way from quite um, bizarre, maybe the buzzing of a mosquito, but even still, if it's at a, a given frequency, it may not be outside the, the realm of possibility, the rotation of the earth and how, how much does that change over time, a grandfather clock, or finally the, the cesium-133 atom. Um, and what do you think would be the, the answer that you would want to come up with? Well, the answer is the vibration of a cesium-133 atom, and this is something that is fairly predictable, and then cesium clocks is an example of an atomic standard type of clock that is fairly accurate and something that's used. So another question is, I suppose that you measure the position of a chair using a meter stick. So that's going to give you some assessment of what is the level of um, fidelity of that measurement would be. And so you record the, the distance of the center of the seat with the wall, which of the following measurements is the most reasonable. And you can see this first one has a huge, a whole bunch of number of significant digits. And then we gradually wind it down to lower, lower um, to one significant digit. And here we have three significant digits. And the question would be for a meter stick, what would be the most realistic measure to, to use? And in terms of the, the resolution you could get with a meter stick, this last one makes sense as being the, the most reasonable answer to be considering for that. 
So here's another one is uh, what is, which of the following the statement is, is, is correct. If an equation is dimensionally correct, it must be true. And if it is not dimensionally correct, it, it may be true. If an equation is dimensionally correct, and it, it may be true. And if an equation is not dimensionally correct, it may be, be true. So that's number two. And if equation is dimensionally correct, it may be true. And if it is not dimensionally correct, then it cannot be true. So here we're getting into this idea of the dimensions that you would have in a, an equation. And finally, if an equation is dimensionally correct, it must be true. And if an equation is not dimensionally correct, it cannot be true. So the answer is number three, if the equation is dimensionally correct, it may be true. Um, and if it is not dimensionally correct, then it cannot be true. So um, interesting if you're familiar with logic that you have this and statement, and that means that both of these would have to be true for, for them both to be um, valid. And so here we're seeing that it, you'd have to be dimensionally correct. And it, it, if it's not dimensionally correct, then it cannot be true. So a couple of things to be thinking about as we're talking about dimensions. Um, so here's a, another one. Which of the following expressions is, is correctly um, using the, the metric prefixes given? And so here you have some, some numbers and um, you have, um, this is like in kiloseconds, milliseconds, microseconds, and nanoseconds. And so these are really different ways of what you could be expressing this, um, what's in scientific notation, but you're trying to be using it in these, um, what's sometimes called SI units, um, using the, the, the way that you would be considering of meters. And so these are like, they're, you would have to be moving this so it would be either 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 3, something like that. And um, if you think about it in that terms, um, one of the ways that you could be doing that it is, is 52 microseconds. And so that's you're taking this to 10 to the minus 6, and then that you move that decimal point over there. And so we're starting to get familiar with some of these things in SI units, scientific notations, and um, um, how many significant digits that you actually have. And so that's question there. So um, suppose that two quantities A and B have different dimensions, and we want to determine which of the following arithmetic operations could be physically meaningful. And so um, here we have a couple possibilities. And um, what we have, we find that three and four are actually things that are, would be, I mean, sorry, two and four. So either division or multiplication. Um, and an interesting thing about dimensions when you're having to do um, multiplication or division, there's a way of canceling those things out and you can sort of um, come up with an answer that would, would make sense. Um, and it this starts to get into some, some different things with, with mathematics. If you plug in a, into a calculator, for example, and you have different dimensions per se, you would see how they would fold, fold out. Um, so those are a couple of things to be thinking about as we, as we move forward. And so with that, let's get into the chapter discussion. This will be the majority of what we'll be talking about today, and then we'll have a few more questions and summary at, at the end. And so the thing that we can think about here is, well, why should we study physics? The goal of physics is to provide an understanding of the physical world by developing theories based on experiments. Physical theories describe how a physical system works and, and makes predictions about the system, which can be verified through observation and experiments. Theories are not absolute. They, they can change over time um, with new information that's um, uncovered. Every theory is a work in progress. Often theories are expressed mathematically. And it has been said that mathematics is the language of science. And so we see that science and mathematics 
dovetail to, together quite well. The basic laws of physics involve such physical quantities as force, velocity, volume, and acceleration, all of which can be described in terms of more fundamental quantities. It is con conventional to use the quantities of length, mass, and time as the basic quantities. All other physical quantities can be constructed from, from these basic three elements. And so that's what we're focusing our time on here as we get into this. And um, we really look to Europe in terms of helping us understand the, the a basic understanding of some of these standards and, and units. And so in 1799 in France, the standard unit of length became the meter. So if you have, you have, instead of using the yard or something like that, it was defined as one ten millionth of the distance from the equator to the North Pole. Up until 1960, the official length of the meter was a distance between two lines on a um, specific bar of platinum um, iridium alloy stored under controlled conditions. Um, in 1960, the meter was defined as 1,650,763.73 wavelengths of orange red light emitted from a Krypton 86 lamp. So you can see that that has a little bit more precision. And then in um, 1983, the light was redefined as the distance traveling by light in a vacuum during the time interval of one over 299,792,458 of a second. This latest definition established a speed of light as almost um, um, 299,792,458 792,458 meters per second. And so um, 10 to the ninth meters per second is um, one of the ways to, to take that into less significant digits, but to a nice round number, 10, um, three times 10 to the ninth. Um, if, if that helps you to, to give a, an idea of that in a more familiar round number. So we talked about length and how over time that that has changed and become more precise. Now let's look about mass. Okay, the international prototype of the kilogram um, with in, is shown in this picture, and it's, this is an accurate copy of the international standard kilometer kept in Severs, France. It is housed under a double bear, but double bell jar in a vacuum at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The SI unit of mass is the kilogram. A kilogram is defined as the mass of the specific plat platinum iridium alloy cylinder kept under the International Bureau of Weights and Measures at Severe, France, similar to the one shown in this figure. Mass is a quantity used to measure the resistance to a change in the motion of an object. It's more difficult to cause a change in the motion of an object with a large mass than an object with a small mass. And so mass is related to how much something weighs, but when you're talking about weight, it, it you bring into the, the what you're talking about in terms of gravity, and gravity is another concept that we'll be talking about later. And so here we also see some examples of um, weights of different things ranging all the way from something incredibly small, like an electron, to something incredibly large, coming up with an estimate of how, what is the mass of the observable universe that we can see? Below that is the Milky Way, the sun, and so forth. So we've talked about length, we've talked about mass, and so now let's talk about time. And we begin to, began to explore this a little bit when we were talking about the, the introductory question. And so in this figure, we're seeing a cesium fountain atomic clock. And so the clock will neither gain nor lose a second in 20 million years. So that's a pretty precise standard to, to be thinking about. The basic unit of time is a second. Historically, it was defined in terms of the time between successive appearances of the sun at the highest point it reached in the day 
uh, in the sky each day called a solar day. Um, and so in 1967, the second was redefined in terms of the atomic clock, which used the characteristic frequency of light emitted from a cesium-133 atom as its reference clock. The second is now defined even more precisely as a, num as a specific number of oscillations of radiation from the cesium atom. The newest type of cesium atomic clock is shown in this figure. And then on the, the table on the right, we have some approximate time intervals. And uh, the, the, the systems of units commonly used in physics are SI units and the units of length um, mass and time for these systems are the meter, kilometer, and second. And there's also other SI units. Um, another way of considering them is something called CGS. Um, so you're thinking in terms of kilogram, I mean, um, centimeters, grams, and seconds rather than um, kilogram um, meters and seconds. So um, you may also be familiar with what we use here in the United States. Um, and so in the US customary system in which the units of mass and time are the foot, slug, and second. And so uh, except for the US, the SI units are almost universally accepted in science and industry and will be used throughout this course with a limited use of Gaussian and US custom, customary units to, to give you some perspective. So here we've talked about length, we talked about mass, and now we're talking about time. And here we're, we're getting a chance to, to look at some of these time intervals for anywhere from things, um, say like the, how old is the age of the universe um, or the age of, of the earth. Um, the secular scientific mindset would tend to give these a fairly old age. And so um, you can keep that in, in perspective, which you'll commonly see those kind of um, large numbers there. Um, how old is a college student in terms of seconds? And so you can see a sort of an estimation of that. How many seconds are in a year, in a day? And it just goes on and on. And here, in a heartbeat, uh, how long does it take for a heartbeat to take place? And so some folks in, in, the, in this class who are into biology, that might make something a little bit more tangible sense for you. So, um, so we talked about these three basic units, and we'll just briefly get into, well, what is matter really consist of? And so um, we can be considering a bar of gold. <clears throat> now let's assume for illustrative purposes that this is 100% pure. And here it's just trying to, to be note, noting that, that it is fairly pure. And so therefore it's consists of one specific element. Um, so what would happen if we cut this in half and, and continue to cut, cut it in half into smaller and smaller pieces? And so we're starting to get down into these larger scales. Um, and Greek philosophers back in the fifth century BC started to speculate, well, um, that we can't cut something to smaller and smaller pieces indefinitely. And then and they reasoned that the process ultimately would end and it would come to something that's, uh, that was at a level that you can no longer cut. And they use a Greek word atomus, which means not sliceable. And this is where we come up with the word atom. And so here we're, we're starting to see, okay, so we're talking about atoms. Um, and so this was um, believed that this was the, the smallest level of material that was there. Um, and we have since found that, that that's not quite true. Inside the atom, there's a nucleus with um, protons and neutrons and electrons. And so this is what we're starting to be giving some sense of how we look lower and lower. So you look at the, at the um, element level, we look at the atomic level, and then we look at the subatomic level when we get into something called quarks. And there was a model of what the atom would look like that Niels Bohr proposed. 
And here is um, an illustration of that. And it kind of looks like a, a miniature solar system with a dense positive charge nucleus occupying the, the position of the sun and the negatively charged electrons orbiting like planets. So that's, we, we see that, that kind of structure. So this model worked pretty well for hydrogen, the, the simplest atom, but it failed to explain many details of the atomic structure. And that's typically what happens when we're dealing with science and we're more specifically focused on physics here. We come up with a model and it does provide some utility in explaining how things work, but eventually say you have to go to something a little bit more precise. In the 1930s, scientists had determined that the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. The proton is nature's almost common carrier of positive charge equal in magnitude, but opposite in size to the charge of the electron. A neutron has no charge and has a mass about equal to, to that of a proton. The number of protons in a nucleus determines what the element is. And so here, um, for some of you that have some biology and molecular biology experience, um, and you can maybe be thinking of DNA, well, there's a way how we can specify an element based on some of its structure. And here, that's what we're, we're talking about here. So the number of protons in a nucleus determines what the element is. For example, an atom with only one proton in the nucleus is hydrogen. Doesn't matter how many neutrons are there. And so you could either have heavy hydrogen if you have more neutrons, but one proton in the nucleus means it is a new hydrogen nucleus. Two protons in, in the nucleus means that it's helium. And so different numbers of neutrons correspond to different isotopes, like I mentioned, heavy hydrogen. Except for hydrogen, all atom atomic nuclei contains neutrons, which all together with the protons interact through the the strong nuclear force, which counteracts the repulsive element, electrical force of the protons. And there's a variety of different types of forces that are there. And we're just, you're hearing maybe some of these for the first time, the strong nuclear force, the electrical force. And so just keep that under advisement and we will start to get into that in more detail as we progress through this through the, the next couple of semesters. So um, let's take a look at, at the size of an electron atom and compare it to the size of a proton, which is a nucleus of a hydrogen atom. The proton is 100,000 times smaller. And so you can see how um, this is a lot smaller. It's five orders of magnitude smaller than the hydrogen atom. If the proton were the size of a ping pong ball, the electron would be a tiny speck about the size of a bacterium orbiting the, the proton a kilometer away. So other atoms are similarly constructed. So there is a surprising amount of empty space in ordinary matter. So you might want to keep that in mind. It's like what we think is solid. Um, we can sit in a chair, we can write on a desk. Um, those are, have a fair amount of empty space which is just another wonderful characteristic of how God created the universe. Now we'll talk, and we're not gonna be getting into too much details in terms of subatomic particles and quarks, but um, let's think about the composition of a proton and a neutron. So here we have a proton with its quark assembly and a neutron with its quark assembly. So they are, um, so protons and neutrons are composed of, of more fundamental particles called quarks. There are um, actually a, a few more than this, but, uh, but anyway, we'll focus on these, that there are the, the up, down, and strange um, quarks, plus there's the charm, bottom, and top. And so here where we're seeing um, up, up, and, and down, uh, as being the ones that are defining these two particular particles. Um, the up chart and top quarks each carry a charge equal to plus two thirds that of a proton and the down strange and bottom each carry a charge equal to minus one third of a proton. The proton consists of two up quarks and one down quark, which gives the, the corresponding charge for the proton to be plus one. 
The neutron has no charge and is composed of two down quarks and one up quark, which has a net charge of, of zero. So the up and down quarks are sufficient to describe all normal matter. So the existence of the other four quarks, which have been indirectly observed in high energy um, experiences, is, is something of a mystery. Just only when you have um, high energy particles slamming into each other that we can see um, some of these other quarks um, in, in ex certain experimental ways. So um, another thing that we would want to talk about is in terms of um, dimension. In physics, the word dimension denotes the physical nature of a quantity. The distance between two points, for example, can be measured in feet, meters, or furlongs, which are different ways of expressing the dimension of length. The symbol is used in this section to specify the dimensions of length, mass, and time are capitals L for length, M for mass, and T for, for time, okay? So, and then we can start to put these things together. So if we look at the table, the dimensions of velocity, which has units of, of meters divided by seconds, so meters per second um, is L over T, and the dimensions of, of area is L squared. So area, you, you need to have um, at least two dimensions that you include there, and we're, we're seeing that. When we are looking for the dimensions of a physical quantity, we, we use brackets. So that's the, the nomenclature that will be used in the te textbook. Um, and so here is an example um, velocity, as we have um, just discussed, has dimensions length over time. So throughout this course, we'll be, be dealing with mathematical expressions that relate different physical quantities. One way to analyze such expressions is called dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis uses the fact that dimensions can be treated as al algebraic quanti quantities. For example, adding masses to length makes no sense. So it follows that quantities can be added or subtracted only if they have the same dimensions. And we had an introductory question that started to get into this. Um, if the terms on the opposite side of the equations have the same dimensions, then they, the equations may be correct, although correctness can't be guaranteed on the basis of dimensions alone. However, if the opposite side of the equation have different dimensions, you can be sure the equation is wrong. Dimensional analysis is a nice way to check your work, and it can be done to be, be used to develop insight into the relationships between physical quantities. So we talked about um, um, a lot of these fundamental things here. Now we're bringing to that totality, um, talking about dimension. Um, we'll talk about dimension, dimensional analysis now. So, and let's look at an example. What kind of relationships are there between distance, acceleration, velocity, and time? Distance, which is often symbolized by X as a dimension of length. T time T has dimension of, of time. And obviously velocity, as we just saw, has dimension of length over time, such as like meters per, per second. So acceleration, which is typically uses the letter A, has dimensions of length divided by time squared. And so um, we're, we're starting to, to get some, some insight into that. So using dimensional analysis, we can write this um, equation. From the results, we can speculate that velocity is equal to the acceleration multiplied by time. So um, you know, in, if you actually just look at the dimensions, so you have, um, um, if you just look at A, A is this is um, length divided by times divided by times squared. And so if you multiply it by time, we're taking one of those t's away. And that's what we're trying to, to show here. So that gives us some, some insight. Um, so in, in another example, you might think of the distance as equal to acceleration times time, but there is a fraction of one half that we couldn't deduce from dimensional analysis alone. 
And so that's uh, another thing that, that comes into play. And um, we're not going to be getting into calculus, but if you took um, derivative of one to another, you would see where this um, one half starts to, to, to show up. With that, um, now we have um, enough to begin to be thinking in terms of um, measurement. Um, and let's talk about the uncertainty of measurement and significant figures. So all measurements have uncertainties associated with them and the accuracy of a measurement depends on the sensitivity of the apparatus, the skill of the person carrying out the measurement and the number of times the measurement is repeated. Once the measurements along with their uncertainty are known, we will often need to perform calculations with these measurements. In, in this course, we will we'll use a method called significant figures, which is used to indicate the appropriate number of digits that should be retained at the end of, an, of a calculation. So just because you put some numbers in a calculator and it gives you all these digits, that doesn't mean that those are the number of digits that you want to be using. And so we're, we're getting a chance to, to see that here with what we're, we're trying to, to follow. And so, um, so imagine that we have a, a length and a width here, and we're, we're going to, we have this, um, um, what is the accuracy of these measurements? And so it's 0.1 centimeters. And so, um, we, if we start to put those together, it turns out that we have uh, more significant digits than what um, the measurements would allow us to really to, to hold on to. Um, and so that's, that's the, the intent of what we're, we're trying to, to show is, you know, what is the, the, the least number of significant digits that we have here? This one has three and this one has two. So what should be, the result of this answer. It should only have two significant digits. And that's the reason why we just do, um, we, we reduce that to what is the, the equivalent number in terms of just two significant digits. And so that's the answer we come up with. So, um, Zeros can be um, a funny thing, depending on how it is written. It can actually be um, inferring that there is a significant digit there that's associated here. Um, so in this first one, we have that it's one significant digit. And in the second one, we have two significant digits. And so th that's what we're, we're seeing in, in those situations. Um, but let's look at some, some more examples. How many significant digits do we have in um, these um, situations? And um, this first one has a question mark, so I'd like to, to have you guys think about how many significant digits are there. And so here, by tacking on these zeros here, we're actually trying to indicate that there's four significant digits. Here, there's three, and since there's no um, zeros at the end, there is um, only two significant digits there. But what would you think would be the case for this first one? So um, I'll just leave that for, for you to, to, to ponder um, as, as, we, as we consider. But really, in this situation, this is um, um, may not be intuitive that you might think that there's four significant digits when actually um, it's more commonly to think that this is only has two significant digits because there's no, there's no decimal point at the end of that. Um, so that's what we're seeing here. It's like this one has um, three, this one has three, this one has three, but this only has one because there's no decimal point at the end. And so this is where you can somehow, if you're not careful, think that you have a more significant dig digits than you actually do. So let's continue with uncertainty and measurements and significant figures. And so here we have um, a couple of numbers that we're going to add together. 
And so we come up with um, five significant digits, but do we actually have the, um, the ability to claim that this is true or, would, or are we going to round it? And that's what we're, we're arguing is that we only have three significant digits. And so therefore it doesn't make sense to be holding on to, to the rest of that precision. Um, so that's how we would do it in, in addition. And um, in subtraction, we, we get the number equal to, we, we have three decimal places as does the result. So we leave it as is. So there's one, two, three significant digits. So we'll just leave it, leave it at that and call it a day. Um, so when performing multiple calculations, there can be discrepancies in the result introduced by the rounding process and the algebraic order in which steps are carried out. Let's look at an example. The, the calculation can be performed in three orders. And you can see how you get a little bit of variation depending on how you, you do these. So do you do the multiplication or do you do the division first? Um, and see, we, this is where you're starting to see a little bit of um, a variation. Um, and as you can see, the results are slightly different. Um, there's slight discrepancies. In, in this book, the work examples report intermediate results to the proper number of significant digits. Only those digits are carried forward. In the problem sets, though, it is a good idea to keep an extra significant digit until the end. So that's something I'd like to have you remember. When you, if you have multiple calculations you're doing, go ahead and keep those um, significant digits until the very end and just round at the end. And so um, that, that's a consistent, um, pretty much a straightforward process um, to, to work through that. So one thing that you'll have when you're starting to multiply, divide, or um, manipulate different types of quantities is that you'll have unit conversions that will start to, to take place. And so um, here is an example. And so say if you're trying to go from um, from inches to centimeters, and you can see how that start to, to work. And so um, units can be treated as algebraic quantities that can be cancel each other. We can make a fraction with the, the conversion that will cancel the units we, we don't want. And so here we, we see an example of um, um, how we would convert 15 inches into centimeters and the um, conversion to go from one inch to um, centimeters, it's 2.54 centimeters per inch. And so therefore, if we multiply 15 inches by that quantity, we'll see that we come up with a number that's 38.1 centimeters. Um, so that's just um, what I want to try and cover with, with that chart. Um, what about estimates and order of magnitude calculations? Sometimes getting an extra answer to a calculation is very difficult or might even be impossible, either for mathematical reasons or because limiting information is available. Estimates can be a useful approximate answer that can help you decide and a more precise calculation is necessary. So um, that's, that's a pretty powerful idea for us to be thinking about is, um, if you're just trying to come up with an order of magnitude, and so here you can think that 75 kilogram is roughly on the order of 10 to the second kilogram, is roughly in the order of um, um, 100 kilograms to say an order of magnitude. And so that's what we're, we're trying to argue here. Um, for many problems, knowing the approximate value of quantity can have merit to to give you some estimate for for what that might mean and what you're trying to to go through um, even if you think of pi you know 3.1415926 maybe you know that by a certain number of digits but if you were just to use one significant digit you could say that pi is three and so if you multiply something by three to just give you a rough order of magnitude that could be giving you um, maybe enough 
to help you out to, to give that basis of understanding. Uh, another thing that we'll be dealing with is coordinate systems. And so here we're having an XY coordinate system, um, X in the right going direction would be positive. Um, y in the positive going up would be a positive as well. And so that's how we would be getting an XY coordinate system. So I think probably this is familiar to, to you. And so here we have this, this zero. And so you have an X and Y that would be zero. And so here we can be seeing how these different quantities, um, um, five comma three, that we have a, an X and a Y value, an ordered pair that's describing that. And so that's what we're, we're trying to, to, to describe there. And so um, you have these numbers and then on this graph paper, we're, we're seeing that laid out. And then we have this one here that isn't specifically defined, but we could calculate this just um, assuming that this is, is on um, a corner. And so you could say that, you know, if the Y would be three, I mean, sorry, the, the X would be three and the, the Y would be eight. And if you wanted to be precise, you could say it's eight and a half. Um, so that's the way it's listed there on, on that. Another coordinate system, instead of doing the, what we call here a Cartesian um, system, is using a polar co coordinate system is where you have, basically you have a, a dimension, a scalar, if you will, um, just a, a value. So a, a radius, if you will, and then an angle. And this is another way that you could be defining a position in space. And this can be popular for, for certain things that where a Cartesian system may not be um, as use, useful. So um, if we take an example, if we point, point to a spe, um, is specify the polar coordinate three meters, and so R would be three, and um, theta would be then 60 degrees, we can locate this point by moving out three meters from the origin in an angle of 60 degrees above the, the um, above or counterclockwise from the reference line. And here is a reference line that we're seeing there. So we talked about a couple of coordinate systems, first of all, being the Cartesian, and the second one being the polar coordinate system. So um, I won't go over this in detail, but in terms of trigonometry, um, it's important that you are familiar with sine, cosine, and tangent. Um, and so here are the relationships in terms of the, the sides, sides. And so sine of theta for this angle here is y over r. Cosine is x over r. And the tangent is x, I mean, excuse me, is y over x. And so that's, and Pythagoras is um, x squared plus y squared equals uh, r squared. So you may want to just be um, mindful of these relationships. And so um, we can be coming up with, if we have the sine of theta is 0 .0, 0 0.866, what is theta? Then you take what is called the arc tangent or the inverse tangent, which would make the 60 degrees. And um, another example would be if we, um, have the, the arc tangent of 0.4, um, and we're trying to find out what um, theta is, this would equate to 21.8 degrees. And uh, there's plenty of um, books that you can look this up, or of course, a simpler way for us to do it now is either use a calculator or just use um, an app on your computer or on your cell phone, and so, or tablet. So those are some things that you can be thinking about. But it's nice to know how you get there initially. And so with um, this type of trigonometry review, you can start to see how you could generate these, these kind of numbers. OK, um, we're gradually introducing a little bit more information as we 
progress here. And so now let's be talking about vector, a vector such as velocity as a magnitude. Um, so here we're, we're looking at somebody driving a race car. And so they're trying to go as fast as they can. They're trying to get as much velocity as they can and to go in a straight direction. That would be the, the what they would try and do. So um, the direction would be a line going through the car um, front wheel windshield and the mass of the car is a scalar quantity. Um, just as the volume of gasoline in the fuel tank. And so when we start to be thinking about these specific quantities and some of these um, things that we've already mentioned, we can start to be thinking in um, practical application and what that might mean. For example, a car's speed may be completely described by, by noting the number on the speedometer. So we can't really read that very well, but we can see that he's going pretty fast and there's a number that's on a speedometer. Um, and there's other ways that we can be looking at quantities um, and trying to determine its velocity. Um, and so here we're, we're thinking in terms of these, these rough values and what is the, what is the magnitude um, of something like velocity and um, we're, we're getting into this discussion of vectors. So, in our textbook, symbols for scalar quantities are shown in italics, for example, for, for mass and T, um, for M for mass and for T for temperature. So here we're, we're seeing that. And so that would be scalars. And then a vector has a little arrow on top of it. And this is trying to um, show that it has a, um, a, a, a scalar quantity as well as a direction. So a vector quantity is characterized by having both magnitude and direction. A scalar quantity has magnitude, but, but no direction. So that's a distinction. So here we're seeing that a bunch of different vectors, and we can see that they all have the same length. And so they have the same magnitude. They're all pointing in the same direction. So those are, are true. Um, so how do we start to determine if they are equal? And um, what, what is the distinction between those? And so, um, and another thing we can do with vectors, and this is where it gets to be useful for the, the methodology we'll have for solving some of our problems, you can actually add vectors. And so remember in a Cartesian coordinate system or in a polar coordinate system, once we put these accurately on a graph, we're, we're actually just making these triangles and we can figure out what this, what this new vector is if we add them together. Um, and so that's we, we have two examples of what that might look like. Um, and you can, do, you can do A plus B or B plus A, and you're still gonna be getting this um, resulting value in, in both of those situations. Um, not only can you do it with two, but you can do it with four. And so you can have all these various incremental type of vectors and some of them can be look like they're fairly, almost nearly opposite in direction. And so these are some things that, that may happen. And so this actually forms a polygon rather than a um, triangle which is still, you could be noticing how you could just, if you were to do A plus B and make one there, and then you can have the result in there and add C to that, and you could get a, the next one. And then you could, with that result, you can do that result in plus D. So there's all kinds of ways that you could go about um, coming up with an answer to this equation. Not only can you add, but you also can subtract vectors. So, um, what if we wanted to be doing A minus B and coming up with the result of what that might look like? So the vector minus B has the same magnitude as the vector B, but points in the opposite direction. So that's what we would do. We would just flip it. And so we see that going down there. And so the resultant would be um, going down here and we could be coming up with a, a position of where that would end up. Um, as a result of subtracting um, B from, from A and getting a net result. 
sometimes when things are not going in the same direction, you would find that true. And um, that, that's maybe an illustration of that. So here we have A, here we have three times A, and here we have the negative of a three, um, three A. And so we're seeing um, these vectors. So they um, three A and minus three A have the same scalar quantity. A has one third of that. And so we're, we're getting a chance to see some of those um, in, in action. So um, let's take a moment to consider your response to this kind of a question. And the magnitude of two vectors A and B are 12 units and eight, and eight units respectively. What is the largest and smallest possible values for the magnitude of the resultant vector? R equals A plus B. And you can be thinking about this. Um, so what would be the, the largest? Um, if they were in exactly the same direction, the largest would be 20. And what would be the, 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 the smallest is if they were in, going in exactly the opposite direction. So it would be 12 minus eight and the result would be four. So the answer would be um, number C, number three in this one. So um, let's consider a vector A lying in the XY plane. And, and see how it can be represented by rectangular components um, a of x and a of y. So what we're trying to, to show here is there's two components. And sometimes you want to do this um, functional decomposition in terms of a coordinate system to, and this 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 is what this will be a, a useful thing for, for us to do. And so we're showing how um, just as like we added these. Um, say a sub y and a sub x to come up with a, we can go the opposite direction. So that's what we're trying to, to show in this example. Um, so the projection of a along the x-axis is called a sub x, and the projection along the y-axis is called a sub y. And so this is a, a, a decomposition of that into its two um, components using a coordinate system, say a Cartesian coordinate system, or if you want to have a polar coordinate system, either way you could be coming up with, with this. Um, so um, from the definition of sine and cosine, we can write the relationship shown. And so um, this is a, another way of having us think about this. Notice that the components from two sides of a right triangle with a hypotenuse of magnitude A. And so we can also write the relationship using the um, um, Pythagore Pythagorean theorem. And so we're, we're also showing that as well. Um, and so these are using some trigonometry to show the relationships between these values. Um, if you want to solve for the angle theta, you take the inverse tangent or the arc tangent, but be aware this formula gives the right answer for theta only half the time. And so what this means is you have a couple actual possible solutions. And um, here we get a chance to, to see, see that is um, you, there, there's a little bit of ambiguity that can occur there. The inverse tangent returns values only from minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees. So the answer in your calculation window will only be the correct and the vector happens to lie in this first or fourth quadrant. Uh, quadrant. If it lies in the second or third quad, uh, quadrant, adding 180 degrees to the number to the calculate, calculator window will always give the right answer. So this is where you need to be understanding the, the limitations of what you're trying to accomplish. And so, like I said here, um, if we're in the first or fourth quadrant, you're okay. But if you're in the second or third qu quadrant over here, then um, that's going to be something that will come up and cause um, a potential issue. Um, so I jumped to this other slide, but this, this is actually something else. It doesn't really show that the way I had um, thought and what, what was relationship to the previous slide. So um, 
Sometimes the angle theta can be defined with respect to another axis as shown in this figure on the right. In general, pick the most convenient way to express the component of a vector. And so here, if you wanted to be using the X axis, or you could also be putting them in respect to the Y axis, um, either one of those are stuff or what you could be using. And so theta can either be described in relationship to the x-axis or in relationship to the y-axis. Um, so this is just some more details about a component of a, um, of a vector. So let's go ahead and think about this a little bit. The figure shown shows two vectors lying in the x-y plane. What are the signs of the x and y components of um, a on the, the vector A, the vector B, and the vector A plus B. So what would be A plus B? How would we, we actually do that? Um, so the, something you would be considering in this is the components of the vector are the projections of that vector on the X and Y axis. Um, so A is um, the X component is um, negative and the Y component is positive. For B, the X component is positive, the Y component is negative. And as a result, the X component is negative and the Y component is negative. So if we do the, the decomposition of both A and B, and then just add those together, we can come up with the, the result of A plus B just by using this type of um, information that we had just shown on this previous slide. And you can either be going to the X or Y axis. And here we're seeing like some examples of say one, um, one that would be either easier to do with the Y axis and one that would be easier to do with the, the X axis. So that's just a little bit more explanation there. So let's take a moment to consider your answer for, for this. Um, what, which vector has an angle with respect to the positive plus x, the positive x-axis, that is the, the range of the inverse tan tangent function. Um, so the range of the inverse tangent function includes only the, the first and fourth quadrants. So you have the, the first, and then you have the four, so that's everything here. So, um, and only vector B has an orientation in this range. And so that's a little bit of information that I think might be helpful for you as you're, you're thinking through this. So um, in terms of adding vectors algebraically, most often you will need to add vectors algebraically in terms of their components. In this method, you simply add the X components and the Y components separately. And so, um, this is a, a way that you can be, it actually can, you can do this instead of doing it um, in this way when we're trying to do it with geometry here, we can be doing it with algebra. And um, this can be something that you could easily put into a computer. And, and so you can see how we go back and forth between um, geometry, trigon trigonometry and algebra and the approach of how we solve these different problems. So here's just a, a guide that you can be thinking about in terms of problem solving strategy. The first thing you want to do is you want to read the problem carefully, say doing it at least twice. Be sure you understand the nation of the problem. Draw the diagram. You can see we have lots of examples of drawings here. And so go ahead and make that drawing. Label all the physical quantities in the drawing using letters that remind you what the quantity is, for example. Um, use M for mass, and then choose a coordinate system to label it. Um, next, you want to be thinking in terms of your strategy. So you want to identify the physical principles, the knowns and the unknowns, and list them. Put circle around the unknowns, um, whatever is convenient for you, but putting circles around them could be helpful. There must be as many equations as there are in unknowns. There can be more, but there can't be fewer. Um, you only, so one unknown per equation is what you want. And so you wanna be choosing 
what would be the, the equations or relationship between the labeled physical quantities should be written down next to each other. Naturally, the selection equal, the, the selected equations should be consistent and the physical principles identif identified in the previous step. And then finally, you wanna be doing the, the solving, set the equations for the unknowns. You wanna substitute the, the unknown values together with um, and obtain a numerical value. And then finally, check your answer. Think about these questions. Do the units match? Is the answer reasonable? Does the plus or minus sign make sense? Is your answer consistent with an order of magnitude estimate? So um, it's a really a lot of good important things that are listed here. And I would encourage you to be thinking about this method methodology. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and do our, our chapter summary, and then we'll be done for, for this chapter. So we talked about um, standards of length, mass, and time, and we gave the history of what was the, the gold standard for which they came about. We talked about the building blocks of matter. Um, matter is um, composed of elements. Elements are composed of atomic particles and then subatomic particles. We talked about dimension analysis. And so um, that was an important how you can start to break things down into components. Um, you can be thinking about that. Um, but we also, another part of dimensional analysis that's more what this is dealing with is you have to understand the, the um, how many significant digits there are, what are the units that are associated with it, and, and stuff like that. We talked about uncertainty of measurement and significant digits. No physical quantity can be determined with complete accuracy. So there is a number of significant different di um, digits. Sometimes that's um, shown with a plus or minus something at the end. Um, we talked a little about conversions, say going from um, meters to, um, or going from whatever you wanna be thinking about miles to kilometers or something like that. And coming up with estimates and order magnitude calculations, that's also something that we talked about that's important. There's a couple of coordinate systems that we, we introduced. First was the Cartesian, the X and Y coordinate system, and then the polar, where you have a, a length and a angle. So R and theta is shown there. So um, you both of them have their times when they're the most advantageous, but that was another thing that we talked about. We did a review on trigonometry, and then we saw these in actions of how you could be using them. And so that's something for, for you to be mindful of. And each chapter, these are gonna be the, the tools in your toolbox that we're gonna be using to try and solve some of the um, problems as we get into more and more details in physics. We talked about vectors, um, the components of a vector, how you can do a functional decomposition into elements. Um, and uh, there's different ways that you can be thinking about those. And so um, by using the, if you know this angle, you can take the, the cosine and sine and come up with these components. And then you can be coming up with an answer to what is the result of adding two vectors together just by using algebra. So you could um, use um, these values to come up with those components and then you just add them together. Um, so that, that is something that you can be thinking about and a strategy as we move forward. Anyway, that is an introduction to some of the important things, units, trigonometry, and vectors, what we'll start with as we progress through our course. And with that, I think we'll call it the, the end of our session. Thank you very much.